Hey there, welcome back. On this episode of the Mindful Money Podcast, I'm chatting with Marcus Garrett. Marcus survived the mean streets of an inner suburb city in Texas. He obtained a BA in business administration from a and became a certified internal auditor and worked as a financial data analyst. He worked through a ton of roadblocks to become an award-winning freelance writer on topics ranging from, this is quite the range, love and relationships to debt and personal finance. On the path, he dug himself an enormous debt hole. And I wanted to have Marcus on the podcast as a success story because he dug the hole, he dug himself out of the hole, then he wrote a best-selling book to talk about it, debt-free or die trying. Marcus, welcome to the Mindful Money Podcast. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to have the conversation. Before we get into this, where is home? Where are you connecting from? I'm out of Houston, Texas right now. So I just say Texas, I moved all around Texas. So yeah, yeah, and that's the next question is, where did you grow up? It's sort of the city streets of A, but what's the town? (laughs) Yeah, I grew up in Texas, born and raised, and I actually met my wife and moved to Denver for seven years. And at that time we dated and I met her seven years later. It's maybe another that love and relationship story that I could tell. (laughs) That's one of our plot twists. And then we made her back to Austin. She was, I met her again in Chicago, and then now we're in Houston. You met her in Houston and met her again in Chicago after a stay in Denver? No, I actually met her originally in Denver. She was home okay. for the summer. She was going to Leola in Chicago. So shout out to Leola. That means something to somebody somewhere. And we, you know, you know, she was 27, I think, something like that at that age. And so we just kind of went our separate ways. Actually, I might have been 27. And then the funny quick part of it is we had a mutual friend. We knew we had a mutual friend, but she has a nickname that I didn't know at that time was her nickname. He's like, Hey man, I want to introduce you to Elle. I'm like, I don't know an L. He's like, she's going to be at this day party, man. You know, she said she knows you. I was like, I don't know an L. You know, I denied it like three times. <laughs> I came into the party and saw what would be my future wife after I was guilt tripped for half the party, but you know, that's how it goes. So going way back to, you know, growing up, and the on the streets part, or maybe there's a house, I want to hear about it. But what did you learn about money or entrepreneurship, you know, as a kid? Did not learn much about money. And it was kind of a two way street. My parents, even to this day, are like remarkably good with money, frugal, Dave Ramsey, dedicated listeners. Actually, I remember listening to Dave Ramsey in the backseat of the car and the radio. And then 20, 40 years later, I met Dave Ramsey because he invited a group of influencers out to his compound. So that was a weird coming of age story. And then we ended up having his daughter on our podcast. So, you know, big world, small world thing. But we didn't talk about money. My parents, in that same traditional sense, a very old school, like we money, you child, you know, we provide, you go to college. And so we didn't really talk about money. And as we've talked about this, we actually talked more about money to me as an adult like adult to adult than we ever did as me adult to child. And they just, you know, they weren't raised that way. That's not something they did in their home. And I just wish we had more earlier discussions around it because they're so good with money. Yeah. <laughs> and I wish I had known a lot more of the decisions behind the actions that they were taking. Well, we're going to, we'll draw some contrasts here in a little bit, but so, so no talk about it at home, but were you curious earlier at all? I was curious in that I wanted to be rich. And so I read another book recently by Damon John, The Power of Broke, the guy from Shark Tank that named and meaning thing to you. And he's actually profiling a story. And the gentleman talks about, you know, when he looked at Batman and Bruce Wayne, he wanted to be Bruce Wayne. He thought being rich was a job. And so I was just interested in money. And I didn't really come from the home. We were actually fairly like I said, frugal, I would call it cheap. And now I know why, because they had all this money saved. They were saving a bunch of money and they were able to put me through college and do another, a number of other things that would benefited me and my sister personally and financially. But from my head, I'm like, I just can't have Jordans. These people are like repressing my need to buy assets. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so, like I said, because I didn't understand the decisions behind it, it just looked like austerity to me. Like, you know, mm. like, I can't wait to escape. <laughs> And so, you know, I was in pursuit of money, but I will say, again, the things that they did positive, they opened a savings account for me. And as soon as I turned 16, encouraged me to get my first job, helped me pay for a vehicle. And I had to pay half for the vehicle. So I had to be invested in it. I even had to have pay half for this remote control car that I wanted for Christmas. And so like they were instilling saving in personal finance and budgeting habits in me. I just never knew why it always just felt mean. <laughs> <laughs> but now I look at some of my peers and I'm like, you know, I'm glad my parents raised me the way they did. Yeah. 
how long did it take you to see that, oh, these are actually good lessons? I appreciate it. Like I said, I appreciate it more now. I also realize that I'm very fortunate. Someone told me recently, I have a, a community newsletter and every Friday I just talk to the community. I don't even try to sell them anything. I just talk about what's going on. And a gentleman who's been following me for a while, he replied, he's like, you're just very fortunate to have your parents still in your life and still instilling values in you and still being able to exchange more on a, like I said, it's almost like a friendship now. Maybe less so my mom will forever see me as a child. But my father is like talking to a friend. My mom is like talking to a friend who thinks she knows better than me. <laughs> and so I appreciate it more, but I, I think I came to recognize like, oh, I have a different experience here. I have something that I need to share. Probably in my late 20s and 30s when I was starting to get out of this debt journey and I was blogging about it. And sharing all these dualities like most people i'm egocentric so i view i think my experience is how the world operates and when i started sharing these blogs which would now be micro blogs and TikTok, people are like oh this is that doesn't happen me and my parents never talk like that and and that's not a, a story that i could relate to so i i begin to recognize that oh i might have something here that i need to share with a community so when was it that you started you had all these you had all this austerity placed on top of you and then you broke free of that and kind of went into kind of a, you kind of spend a lot. So just walk us through that. Start at the beginning. How did you dig yourself into the debt? The first time I escaped, I was actually 18 years old. I left for college. I went to a dorm, a University of Texas at Austin. And I went back home after that mistakenly. I mean, there were some summer breaks, but I went back after school. I had a small loan because I exhausted some of the funding that I had. About 90% of my school was paid for based on some decisions that my parents had made and some funding that I got from, from you know, accolades. And I was like, oh, I'm just going to move back home and pay this off. And like my mom was like over my shoulder, just like she does. Like, I think she went through my email once or somehow to this day, I actually don't know how she found out. But I was my girlfriend at that time was long distance. And somehow she got to our conversation. She won't reveal her secrets. I guess she's Batman in this scenario. And I was like, never again. I'm not going back to Shawshank. <laughs> so I like put all my plans aside. I moved out. I must have been I graduated at 22. And so I escaped again, or at least so I thought. And. I now look back and I, when I talk to young individuals, I realize that I was wrong in a lot of the friction and it hurt me financially so that I could have come out of school completely debt free if I was just able to allow my mom to read my would have been AOL messages. I don't know what the kids are using these days. The DMs. If I, I was just OK with my mom monitoring my DMs for maybe six to nine more months, I could have been completely debt free. But I'm like, no, I'm going to go out here, put the world on his ear. I thought when you graduated college, that was your starting line to rich. And so I was like, I've got a college degree now. I don't need y'all anymore. And as you said, in my book, Debt Free or Die Trying, it didn't quite work out that way. First job out of college, I made $9 an hour technically, even though it was a salary job. I made 19000 I made less at my first job out of college than I did working an hourly job. Very humbling, 22 years old. And I got a consolidation offer in the mail. I didn't even know what a consolidation offer was. And they mailed a 22 year old who had spent $9,000 on three credit cards at that point, not maxed out, a blank check. I think it was about 15,000. And I went crazy. <laughs> so the quick version of it, we can go deep or we can keep it shallow, was I spent $26,000 in 72 hours. This is Googleables, Googleable. So, I mean, it's a story that anybody can read on their own time. And that ultimately started the journey where I started living the debt free or die trying lifestyle. I just didn't realize it at the time. So you built it up to 26,000. Was that the peak of the debt? I wish it was. So okay. the peak of the debt would come at about 30,000. I think for my own sanity, I've never done the real math with interest and <laughs> carry over loans. And I did a second consolidation loan to bring it, bring all that debt together before I finally got my stuff together. But what happened, I, I do remember this part of the story. I, I bought a Casio, I think it was, flat screen TV, and it was 42 inches and it survived like two relationships. It like through thick and thin, I kept this TV with me. It was like the first flat screen TV. Now people are hearing this story and in their mind, flat screen TV, maybe 300, oh, 42 Shh. inches, maybe seven. It was $3,000. <laughs> yeah, back in the and day, first one, yeah. It's, yeah, it's the most difficult thing for people to believe in my story. They can like wrap their head around 72 hours, like oh, I've seen rap videos and like, oh, you know, I've been to Vegas once. But they're like a $3,000 flat screen. That's like the most argumentative 
story I have that I ever tell. I guarantee you, I'm sure I have that receipt somewhere. And so that put us to 29,000. And then I met a, around that time, you know, because apparently I'm rich, <laughs> I met a high maintenance girlfriend, an enabler. And so we just kind of went out and first we lived a consolidation loan, then check to check, and then eventually she left. And the money ran out. And so did a lot of the friends. And I was left with $30,000 in debt. Oof. So what was going on around you? Did you have friends doing the same thing or were you different from peers? Similar to the story with my parents, I think my being so transparent and honest around money and personal finance, I've been blogging since the early 2000s, graduated in 2005, but I've been podcasting since 26, 2013. I started the personal finance podcast in 2016. And I think my transparency and openness has bring people forward because I used to be confused. Where did y'all get all y'all's money? And so they were spending their refund and college checks because I didn't have any. My school was paid for. I didn't get refund checks. I didn't even know what a refund check was. So basically, we were all pre social media. I guess we had Facebook at the time, but we were all trying to keep up with the Joneses on a make believe lifestyle like none of us had money. But we all thought we had money because we were all spending money on credit, just different varying lines of credit. And so I've heard a lot of that. And well, that would have been my mid to early 30s. Like, yeah, man, I didn't have any money either. I was spending my student loan. And yeah, I didn't have any money. I was spending my I was my food check, which should have gone to my food. And so it's been a, a nice coming of heart, if you will, of individuals and peers. And I don't want it to come across as no one was taking advantage of me. It was more like, well, I'm here. You've got a tab open. You know, why don't I just throw a bottle on there too? You already got two. What's another four? And it's like, like no one was taking advantage. And I didn't stop anybody. I'm like, yeah, break, make it six. You know, it's like we were just enabling a lifestyle that we thought all of us were living, but we were all fronting. Do you think that was limited to like your proximity, your peer group, or do you think this is like universal across like the generation? I won't say my experience is unique. I can say that for sure. But I think it's yeah. more variations. It'd be almost like the multiverse. So we were all living in the same timeline on different multiverses. So I might have been in the club. You might have been in San Jose. Like, <laughs> But I think what the similar theme is, and you can any popular or viral CNBC article, it feels like it seems like the arc is we went to college. They were selling credit cards on the yard for t-shirts and yo-yos. I got a yo-yo. Some friends got a Frisbee. And like, we all have this story where we got some swag and then we ended up in debt 10 years later. Like that credit card, I think it's illegal these days. I don't think they can sell credit cards on campuses anymore. But I do remember walking through the yard and they were like, discover card, MX, open up a line of credit. And I was like, free money. So I do think that is where the multiverse splits and then how people spent that money or spent those credit cards is different. But we all ended up in debt. I went to college in 1990, it was my first year, and I got into my dorm room, and on my dorm room table, there was a box, and inside the box was a cookie, a coupon for the local sandwich place, and three or four credit card applications, right? So boom, right there, you walk in, opportunity for debt immediately. I want to bring a quote up from your book, because a minute ago you said, I don't want to say that no one took advantage of me, or, but I want to point this quote out. This is a great quote, by the way. So my credit limit always seemed to increase right when I needed to buy or do something I had no business buying or doing. It's as if the credit card companies had an algorithm synchronized with my financial stupidity. I love that, by the way. And do you think they actually have the algorithm? That still feels true, even to this day. I mean, I still get lines of credit increase that I've never used. And, And same thing with my wife now. And we're building our credit together. And, you know, I'll give an example. So we just bought our first home and we're probably going to turn into an investment property. And I think we were here maybe one or two months and we were like, oh, you know, we were like, we're first time home buyers. So we're like, okay, we wish we had known this. We had wish we had known that. And this came in the form of a, a letter. <laughs> so I don't know if the house is bugged, but they're like, hey, you know, those things that you didn't like last week, we'd be willing to fix and repair and buy your home. It's like an investment firm. We're like, we've only been here two months. We're not so dissatisfied that we're going to sell after two months. But both of us were like, it was a little weird. That was a little suspicious. That was a little eyebrow raising. It could be extreme coincidence, but it does always seem like, man, I think I'm just going to be responsible this week. And then... I get an email, almost like my phone goes off right then. Like, here's a free line of credit or points for a vacation that you weren't going to take, but now it's a great deal to take. (laughs) So it does feel like all these devices are listening to us in some type of capacity. I have no evidence against this, but I do look forward to the civil case. (laughs) 
<laughs> so what, no lawsuits. So what was rock bottom for you? Like what, when did you go like, what the hell? I remember it exactly. I was 27 and by this time the girlfriend that had enabled a lot of the money is gone now. And I moved back to Austin and I had like made this pledge that I'll never go back home. I'm too good for this city, you know, and which is interesting because she went to New York. <laughs> I ended up back in Austin. And so I missed a credit card payment. And to this day, I would testify in court that I didn't get the, the letter. You know, this was back before I'm old enough, elder millennial, like we got letters, they mailed things to us. So I didn't have an electronic bill. I don't even think I had an electronic profile. My perspective, I never got this bill because I've never missed a credit card. It's like a point of contention for me. <laughs> and so I didn't. And I got the next bill. And the interest on that bill was twenty nine point nine nine percent, which I think credit cards could still do. I thought it was illegal. And so they had like quadrupled my interest rate overnight. And I was like, you know, and this was the same company I had signed up for back in college, you know, small world, big world. And I'm like, hey, this is obviously a misunderstanding. We've been in a 10 year relationship together. I'm just going to give my boys a call. We're going to work this out. And I was like, hey, guys, you know, what's going on with this interest rate? You know, I can't afford this. And they're like, well, basically, good luck. Like, you know, and I did several ego based, poor decisions from there. I'm like, close this credit card. I'm taking this industry down. <laughs> and I transferred that credit over to another car thinking I was going to prove a point. They're still in business. And I think they're a multi billion dollar entity, if you're curious. And. You know, as I think a lot of your listeners would know, I messed up my credit utilization, all things that I did not know at that time. But rock bottom actually came a couple months later because I can't make these payments anymore. And I was at that time working three jobs already. I had my it's amazing how much in denial you can be when you're able to make minimum payments. So I'm like, everything's fine. But I didn't realize the tsunami was already going out. The wave was already coming out. And that first credit card was the earthquake. And so the wave's coming back and I just don't realize it yet. And so while I should be running to higher ground, I'm just going about my normal life, working my three jobs, living paycheck to paycheck. And I once I realized I couldn't make the payments, interestingly enough, I wasn't getting any credit card increases and I wasn't getting any consolidation loan offers because I imagine, which I didn't know, my credit score was probably at rock bottom as well, similar to my emotions. And I finally got one loan offer and I hadn't seen one in a long time. It was like the white whale sighting. I was like, I got to get this loan. And I called him up and I remember I couldn't answer basic financial literacy questions, but I couldn't. And he was, I think the only, if it's an SAT test, the only thing I would have got right is my first name. And he was like, you know, what's your, your utilization? What's your credit card debt? How much do you owe? How, what is your debt to income? And I couldn't answer any of these questions. And it was so embarrassing and just so demoralizing. And I'm sure this is just a guy in a call center <laughs> actually probably making more money than me. So I can't really diminish him at that time. And I realized when he put me on hold, I need this guy to say yes. I don't know what I'm going to do if he comes back and says no. And fortunately, he does come back and say yes. And he's like, you know, we'll transfer the funds to you. And I just remember hanging up and I was like, I'll never be in this position again. I will never allow this to happen. And that's why I started living what would become debt free or die trying. But that's why I call it that is pre pandemic. You know, it's not the, the best title in the world now, but it's, you know, I'm not going to do this until it's inconvenient. I'm going to get out of debt until if it kills me. And I started, I went to still around bankrate.com, probably not as large as they were then. And I looked up a debt consolidation calculator. I was like, what would it take to get out of debt? And that was my first plan. I printed it out as a PDF. <laughs> so there's points in the first half of the book where it's honestly hard to keep reading because you beat yourself up pretty hard. Like I think the word that comes out the strongest in the first half are words like stupidity and irresponsibility. And so why hit that so hard? One, again, I want it to be transparent. I didn't want it to seem like, oh yeah, I put this loan together and that was that. And I wanted people to feel and either two things empathize like oh man this guy's at bottom or recognize because there's people at bottom listening to this show right now that i'm not alone i remember i felt alone because i can't talk to my friends about it they're all rich you know we remember in college they're all rich like we aren't talking about money at this time so i can't talk to anybody about this this is a very real struggle that i'm going through but in my mind i'm the only one going through it no one can relate to this no one's ever been in this amount of debt no one's ever missed a credit card payment i'm the only one and so I wanted that to come across in the book. And I want to set the stage for what a comeback will look like. I was talking to my wife and I've talked on a few shows about this in today's reality. 
it's also much more expensive. I almost think that I might need to revise or update the book. When I was getting out of debt, interest rates on credit cards were about 10 to 14%. If they're under 18% on average, I would be shocked right now. And so it's a very different reality that people are facing, even if they were just getting out of $30,000 like myself, that are more. This is, I do want people to recognize that I recognize that this is a different environment that they're facing. And I want to, that to come across in the book, what I was feeling and experiencing going through that. Yeah. I'm curious, there's, you talk a bit about this in the book, about how you had to solve this. I have a limited income. I have to pay minimum debt payments and hopefully some amortized principal, but I also have to pay for daily living. You have to make choices. How did you manage that? I would say a little bit of luck. And I, the reason the awkward pause there is I only knew at that time how to trade time for money. So I only knew how to get nine to five. So the three jobs had a nine to five and I'll disclaim, it'd be a hypocrite of me not to say. And so I was making $50,000. I was putting Dell computers together. I apologize to people now because I hated that job and you probably got a pretty beat up computer because I was you know, slinging it all around that warehouse, taking out my frustrations <laughs> on these computer parts. So I apologize if you got a computer between the years. I sound like one of those infomercials. You got a computer between 2005 and 2007. I apologize. Please contact this number. And then I was selling... Which was, again, the luck part. I started working at Singular. Singular got bought out by AT&T. And they came out with this amazing device called the iPhone. And it was the iPhone 1. You could not keep the iPhone in store. So I was getting this ridiculous commission check because people were like fighting me, like, take my money and give me that phone. So I was like making money, but I was working three jobs. And for one point there, I started working at a hotel on nights. This is how much, like, cause like I said, all I knew was time, trade time for money, get hourly jobs, do salary to work. And I started working nights at a hotel on the graveyard shift. But you know, you can imagine I wasn't old, but I was getting older. So I couldn't pull all nighters like I could in college, which in my head, I thought I could. And so I just started what now it's called burnout. I didn't have a term for it. I was like, I'm exhausted all the time. What is this called? 10 years later, I learned it was burnout. So I started burning out and I was like, you know, let me look for a job that consolidates all these pay payments that I'm, or all these salaries in this case. And I started looking in 2008, which means something to some people at the start of a recession. I was like, I'm going to get a job. <laughs> And I started looking around and once again, where preparation meets opportunity, I had gotten two certifications as an internal auditor at that time. And I applied for a, do a job in Denver, Colorado. You see me bringing it home. And yep. I learned later, the director was very impressed. He's like, oh, this guy has two certifications. He's clearly very dedicated to his job. Not realizing I was $30,000 in debt. And I just, <laughs> I was doing whatever it took to get ahead. And I remember I had a job interview and I was reading online, it's the recession. Jobs on average take 24 months to get six weeks. He called me. I had a phone interview and an hour after the phone interview, he's like, you're hired. How much do you want? I had never negotiated my salary in my entire life. I never even thought about like what I would want. And I had watched a movie once about a guy who said he wanted 70,000. And in the movie, he was supposed to be making a lot of money. So I was like, 70,000. He's like, sure. <laughs> to this day. To this day, Damn. I don't know how much money I could ask for. <laughs> it haunts me. I lose sleep over this. <laughs> and so fortunately, that 70000 was be the stepping stone. It was basically, it ignited my journey to getting out of debt. So I'm not one of those people that's like, oh, just austerity and you know, leave, live on beans and rice until you're out of debt. I upped my income and lowered my expenses. And I exploited yeah. that gap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm wondering if you sort of developed this four step process, you know, at that point, or did you do these four steps and then look back and go, oh my God, there's those four steps and tell us the four steps. Definitely did not develop them at that point. Actually, that was the first book. So I was blogging by this point and I was actually making a little bit of money doing freelance writing and blogging as well. Like I said, anywhere I could get money, I was scraping and clawing because all of it was going towards the debt at that point. And I released that book. Actually, I was talking about it on the blog and people were like, hey, you need to release a book. And I, my brother-in-law says I forced Gump my way through life. So I, people were like, you should write a book about this. I was like, all right. <laughs> I didn't really think much of it. it. I was already blogging. So I just took the blog. I dumped them in a book and released it. I released it like in the depth of night too, because I was like, no one's going to read this book. And once again, no one can relate to being out of debt or being in debt. This is stupid. No one would, no one will read this. It became, it sold well for how poorly written and organized it was. 
that was 2016. In 2020, I was like, you know what? Maybe I should like, you know, people are actually reading this book and I'm embarrassed by it. It's my product. So I worked (laughs) with an editor and she was like, you know, I think you shouldn't organize organize this chronologically, which is what I did. I told my story from you. You read version two from beginning to end. She's like, you should organize this thematically. Like, what are the lessons and takeaways that people should have? And that's how we jointly came up with the four step plan. So it's debt and it's the debt is an acronym. It's D define the problem, which for most people. I, it's a ridiculous statistic. I know it's, it might be 60, but I know it's at least 30% of people don't even know how much debt they have. They get a bill, they pay it. They don't know their interest rates. They don't know the credit card limits. They just, and if they're lucky, they pay it and people miss their, their payments. And so for me, it's define the problem. How much debt do you owe? And a lot of people have to go to annualcreditreport.com to get their free, all their reports because they've never looked at them. Tally that up. Go to sleep because you're going to be stressed. <laughs> Probably have a little anxiety that night like I did. E is establish a plan. So after you have come back and you've gotten past your anxiety, for me, my plan was bank rate. There's so many tools now that like, I mean, Credit Karma, Nerd Wallet, like you can name drop all day. They're all great. But the plan, the point is to come up with a plan and pick a system. So if you're one of those people that get paralyzed by analysis and you need a decision, bankrate.com is still around and they have an infinite amount of calculators. So still use them. But the point is to come up with a system. How are you going to get out of debt? What does that look like? How much do you actually have to pay each month to truly get debt? And when do you want to get out of debt? Then build a budget around that, which is B. And then T, trust the process. And as part of trusting the process, I recommend that people automate it. That is one thing that I stumbled into. I automated all my payments. I'm an auditor by trade. That's the day job that I do. So that already made sense to me. So a lot of people need to remove themselves from the process. And that's why I say trust in the process. You've got a proven system. You've ran your calculators, trust the process and get out of the way. Yeah, that's awesome. You also wrote, and maybe this is a function of it being the second iteration, but there's a chapter, there's a, like, you start describing, you know, if you have a $30,000 salary or a $50,000 salary or a $100,000 salary, this is how much car home you can afford. And then you go into some, this is the three or four different kind of budgeting methods. And so you start talking about specifics with, with some, a pretty broad brush. Was that the second? Was that part of the first or was that the second duration? That was the second edition. And that was probably informed by, so I have a giveaway. First, it started with a blog, you know, some things don't change. So I wrote a blog. I like looking at data. Even to this day, I still like looking at data. And I had looked at like the Census Bureau and their cost of living and debt to income recommendations. And I broke it down at that time by 30,000, which was the median income earner. It's 40,000 now. 50,000, which was just in the middle and 70,000 at that time was around household. Then, I, as you said, I did 100,000 because a lot of people just see that as a benchmark. And I was like, this is what your debt outlay based on these recommended tools and best practice should look like. And like it did ridiculous numbers. <laughs> Once again, you know, Forrest Gump, I'm like, oh, here's this boring data that no one to look at. I think it was like one of our best performing blogs. And so I ended up turning that into a PDF and I give it away for free now. I give, and I, I, a lot of my personal finance and debt tools, I give away for free because I feel that's just so foundational for people to grab. Uh, and I, you know, I do that all on my YouTube channel. And that likely made its way into his book, either some iteration of that. I might not know the genesis behind it, but it's some iteration of that likely influenced that decision. Got it. You talk about, well, I want to ask you, you said you got out of debt by raising your income. But I'm assuming you have a lot of feedback from other people, you know, people saying, hey, I read the blog, you know, I watched the YouTube channel, I read the book. Do you get a sense if that's how most people solve it? Or are there still people just trying to cut, 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 cut expenses? I actually would say it's probably about 50-50. We used to, I was, this is my third podcast, we used to call it putting the personal in personal finance. So a lot of it you have to tailor to the person. I would say going back to that multiverse, uh, that story I wrote in the book feels like someone else's life now. Not only does it feel like another lifetime ago, it almost feels like I'm reading about someone else because I don't spend like that. I'm not as materialistic anymore. And I don't even like I had a need to show that I had money or at least at that case, look like I had money because I actually didn't have anything. And so because I don't have that anymore and the example I would use, I was actually doing a speaking about the book once in New York. And a young man came up to me. I say young man, he's in his 20s. And he was like, hey, you know, how do you cut back on expenses? I'm in New York, obviously. And I did some, I knew some cost of living analysis. I was like, yeah, it's about 30% expensive out here. Homes are 300% more expensive. I I get that that's a very real reality. I was like, well, you might consider, you know, going out less. 
it looked like I told him he might as well grow a third arm. <laughs> like, and I, I thought about it later and I was like telling a 22 year old not to go out like that, that doesn't resonate with him. And so that and many lessons like that and, you know, lots of coaching, I realized I need to better tailor. You know, you can give it, like you said, a broad brush. Here are some general themes. You know, Dave Ramsey yeah. has a debt snowball. I go over four tools and one of them is the debt snowball. But really, it's what works for you and your personality that you'll be able to successfully stick to. Because I tell people, unless it's medical or school loans, getting into debt can be fun. My debt story was fun. I spent a whole bunch of money. And I had a whole lot of fun. It's the getting out of it that's painful. And so doing something you don't want to do and that's not fun for twice, I tell people it's usually going to take no less than twice the amount of time because not only have you spent a lot of money in a short period of time in most cases, your interest rates, as I mentioned, are 10, 14, 18 percent on that debt where you spent it along. And so, yes, you can tackle the principal, but it's not going to be as fun and it's probably going to take twice as long as it took you to get into it. So you need a system that you, your personality can tap into. So I can tell you all the systems in the world. I can run all the numbers and the math. You just, I, mean, I can put into, like you said, an algorithm. I can put into an Excel spreadsheet. I can put in a blog, YouTube, TikTok, whatever. But what resonates with you that you'll be able to stick yeah. with twice as long as you were doing it to get into it? Yeah, if you don't stick with it, you just end up back where you started, right? Right. So did you, so you have this job, you got a great job, you're, you know, data analyst, financial data analyst. Did you start writing the blog then? And then was that a side hustle? And did you ultimately like replace your full-time job with the side hustle job, the income from the side hustle job? And how did that work? So it's two versions. At that time, I was just blogging. Once again, Forrest Gump in my way through life. And I actually had, I'm still friends with this guy. I didn't realize how popular our blog, it was seven writers on this particular blog. And he was like, yeah, we were doing 100,000 visitors a month at our peak. And once again, the, the ignorance and benefit of youth, you, you know, you kind of extrapolate that your experience is everybody's experience. Like we were doing news sites numbers. <laughs> like we should have monetized a lot more is kind of how this story ends. But that being said, that's a lesson learned for all of us. I was just kind of taking whatever I could get. So I pick up, people would read the blog and they'd be like, oh, you are a good writer. Do you want to write for us? I'm like, yeah, sure. How much will you pay me? Like I didn't have a rate sheet. I didn't negotiate. I was just like, they're like, we'll give you 50 bucks. I was like, cool. They're like, we'll pay you in likes. I'm like, all right, whatever. I like likes, you know. I had a different perspective at that time. I was in my 20s. And so the second half of the story is that's where I'm trying to get now, because as I opened with, I'm more focused on my purpose. My wife, we debate this, <laughs> but I think I would at this point take less money for more personal satisfaction, more time freedom. That's actually more important to me. I don't have a car with rims anymore. It has rims on it, but it doesn't look as shiny as the one that I had in college. <laughs> and so like my perspective has changed. And now I'm like, well, this is duality that I fight with. Like I really, I found what I enjoy. I enjoy podcasting. I enjoy blogging. I enjoy writing. I enjoy communicating and connecting with the community. I think maybe some of your listeners can resonate with, and uh, you know, not to be dismissive, but that's kind of social and community work. And when you're familiar with those terms, those jobs don't pay very much. And so do I follow my passion and my purpose and cut my salary in half <laughs> or maybe even a third that I've worked towards and right now that answer is no. And I'm trying hmm. to replace the income. And that's been m recognizably more challenging than I thought it would be. But it, it's because I was so successful in the workforce. So I scaled up to six figures. I, another story that I tell is I grew my salary by 400 percent. My success in itself has created a golden handcuffs of creating a lifestyle that aligns with the income that I have. And it's like, man. If I had just been aligned with that income at 40,000 and found satisfaction there, got out of debt, and that was all I'd known, you know, where would I be? So I'm trying to find peace with those very real worlds. And right now, what it's looking like is I'm probably, so I have my own business now. And the pandemic has, coming out of the pandemic, will probably open up some revenue streams. Speaking used to be one of my, my most, or was trending up as my most lucrative. And I just remember all of them getting canceled <laughs> on March. Yep. What was that 2020? <laughs> yep. And so Fun. I'm trying to bring that back and just kind of find my place, not to get extensional, but in the world that also aligns with the income that I want to take home. Yeah. So are you an influencer? <laughs> I don't like the term, but I have been. Yeah. Okay. Good. Me either. 
and I am in influencer campaigns. I am literally an influencer. That is how I get paid. That's my contract term. They're like influencer.llc or comma LLC dot. And so, you know, at the same time, I'm not going to block my blessings or my bag. So <laughs> if you want to call me an influencer, pay me a few thousand dollars, I'll take it. But it's not like how I introduce myself. I don't have any business card that says influencer. Do you have like a target audience that you're trying to reach and teach? Or is it really just anyone that reads the blog and loves the book? It's an excellent question. So I've actually recently made what I guess would best be described as a pivot. And I'll answer it this way. Before it was everyone. I would take all comers because my brand was personal finance. I had this story of getting out of debt. And mind you, this is a 20, 20, 30 year story now, um, which you know gives people an idea of how old I am. And while I'll still always be passionate about that, like I said, I've tried to pivot towards, okay, I might need to niche down and maybe even speak to a smaller, more lucrative community if I want to do this full time to support a lifestyle that I want. And so I still want to speak to that community. And the pivot is actually right there available on YouTube. I'm starting up a new channel, which sounds cliche because YouTube is old, but I'm starting something new on there. But YouTube is I was talking to somebody about this earlier that has tested the it has stood the test of time as far as monetization and building business. It's, it's actually pretty impressive. And so that being said, I'm starting a new channel that will tailor to a different audience and probably a smaller audience. Do you want to name the audience or no? Yeah, right now it's a how to with the Marcus Garrett. And so I plan to monetize it through three different ways. You said influencers. So I've been building, building and building affiliate campaigns since probably a decade now. Part And so for those who don't know, you partner with, let's say, Amazon. And I actually am an Amazon partner. If you click a link, one of my links, I get a small percentage of, you know, you buy a couch, you buy a TV, whatever. I get a small percentage of that. The other way I was going to do it is, you know, speaking to coaching. So the reason it's specifically a how-to channel is because I already know, I've already, you're basically you've told me you're a lead because you're like, how to, you're asking the question that you want answered. And if that video can't fulfill that answer for you, I'm going to offer coaching and, you know, basically upsell services from there. And then I've been trying to figure out how to monetize my voice since I was age 16. Cause people have been telling me for years, like you got a great voice and it has been frustrating me for 20 years. Like that means nothing to me if I can't monetize it. And so I'm going to start seeing if I can, I've done some before less formally, but like voiceover and speaking services. So it's basically a three tiered audience. It's the, you can get paid just by existing on YouTube. If you have a channel with a thousand subscribers, I got like 500 right now. Number two would be tailoring coaching and lessons like an upsell, you know, here's the video. And then number three would be like, Hey, do you want me to voice over your video? You can see in this video, I did a voiceover. Is this something that you'd like for your service? And so I'm really excited about this because I've talked to somebody who's made millions doing this. <laughs> he made like one video. <laughs> it just blew up. And I'm like, I've produced 250 videos, but it wasn't like a focused business plan. So I'm, this is going to be a, like a business. I'm really coming at it with the lens of data driven and how do I scale this to monetize? That's awesome. And, you know, just from my perspective, you can have a great voice and not monetize it. That's fine. It's okay just to have a great voice. Like it's okay to, you know, just be good <laughs> I, at I, something. I hope so. Cause 20 years I have not been able to beyond obviously the speaking engagements. <laughs> yeah. So there's just a ton of noise out there. And I ask every single guest to simplify something for us. And I'm gonna ask you about debt. So if someone finds themselves in debt, what is just one thing that they should do today to like more financial success, get out of debt faster? First thing I'm gonna say is stop. Most people in debt are still spending, they're still digging. And I don't say that dismissively and I don't even say that harshly. It's because you kind of you're in denial, like, well, I'm making the minimum payments. I'm living paycheck to paycheck. There's a report that came out that said millennials are living paycheck to paycheck at 60 percent. And people at six figures are living at paycheck to paycheck at 48 percent. So it's not a income bait. You can't spend your way out of irresponsibility. So I guess that answer there, you know, the inverse of that would be some accountability, even if that accountability is I know I'm in debt. I know how much debt I have. I know all the interest rates on my credit cards and I don't care. I'm going to keep spending. I can live with that. I can respect that. I, I'd clap my hands if I wasn't on a podcast. I respect the accountability of that. But usually what I see is people are like, I don't know how much I have. I don't know where all the money went. It just runs out. It's a mystery. There's just more month at the end of my money. And I'm like, eh, have you checked the numbers? And then they kind of just fade off to the black. And so that's like, have you... Do you know how much debt you had? Do you know your plan? Do you know your purpose? Do you know the personal and personal finance, I guess, tying it all together? And if you can answer those questions, 
like I could not at age 27 at rock bottom when at this call center who's probably just going through a questionnaire and I couldn't answer any of his questions. If you can answer that questionnaire, hey, I, that is to me the personal choice that you make to live your life. We're all adults here, the majority of us are. I'm fine with that. So uh, if you're in debt and you don't know and don't like where you are, I would say to stop and start planning. And for me, it's building a system and like I said, automating. If yeah. you're in debt, you know where you are and you like it, keep doing you. You know, if you're not drowning and facing bankruptcy, I know some people who live paycheck to paycheck and they're the happiest people I've ever met. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. So just really quick, it's very interesting that, that one of the two key levers that you have are have a plan, stick to the plan. Because for 25 years, I've been saying the same thing about building wealth. So, you know, building wealth is having a plan and sticking to the plan in the same way that getting out of debt is having a plan and sticking to a plan. I think there's something interesting about that. Someone should write a book. You know, maybe it's you. One other question, and that's, uh, what is one thing that they're doing? I don't know what you're going to say. It's a simple, what's one thing that they're doing right now that they should stop doing? Don't say spending. Like, that's an obvious one. Well, if I'm not going to take the obvious, and I'll actually plug a book right there as far as wealth. My favorite, I read 25 books when I rewrote my book. It's The Simple Path to Wealth by J.L. Collins. So if you read J.L. Collins, yeah, other possible finance book other than mine, and you don't have to read mine, read his. His is the best roadmap of those 25, and it's at my number one. The thing I would say is if you're struggling and in debt, is to look at ways to monetize. And so, you know, the cliches that you mentioned too. So these influencer side hustles and a lot of times they're pandling MLMs and all that type of stuff. I'm not saying that, but yeah. I was able to monetize skills and passions. I like writing. I look like looking at data. I'm a money nerd. And I thought I would never be able to build an audience o over that. And I was completely incorrect. I didn't even believe in myself. <laughs> My audience believed in me before I did. So if you're struggling with that, you might already be able to increase your income and it may be no further than what's already on your resume. Wow, that's awesome. Just as a quick aside, my nephew texted me this morning and said, hey, Jonathan, what's the best book that you can read for personal finance? And I told him, J.L. Collins, okay. you know, absolutely. That's the number one book. Yeah. But I said the second one was my book, not your book, but my book. <laughs> I understand. Uh, on my page, <laughs> mine is actually listed first, but JL's is second. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell Amazon everyone read it first. Yeah, that's my Amazon shop page. So y'all more than I see. I am an influencer on there, and I will get a small kickback, but it's like less than four dollars because books are usually ten to twelve. So if you yeah, want yeah, to, yeah. it's out there. So just before we wrap up, is there anything that uh, people don't know about you? I mean, I know you've been way out there, been very honest and very open. But is there anything that people don't know about you that you really want them to know, or maybe they just don't remember? Actually, it would be difficult. I think what I've done a good job of, and I think that makes me relatable, is I am so transparent and open. I mean, we began this conversation. I call it the black box before you actually hit the record button on the podcast. It's like, I try to be an open book. I haven't had a question yet that I haven't answered. Like, I got the camera. <laughs> I remember probably one of my most awkward interviews, actually a radio show with uh, Tom Joyner. I'm not even sure if he's still on the air. And uh, I was doing a review of another book. And this was back when I was doing the relationship writing. And it's about Kobe Bryant and how he cheated on Vanessa at that time. And uh, it was like saying why that's okay. That's basically his book was advocating for it. You know, controversy has sold 20 years ago, it sells now. So that's why I was on the radio show. And they were like, you know, have you always been faithful to your wife? Or uh, I wasn't married at that time. To your girlfriend? And I, it must, that, that pause felt like 20 seconds. That pause was so long, people called in to talk about the pause. <laughs> <And> so, <laughs> I have a track record. And the answer was no. I think I said something like, well, you know, I do my best. <laughs> Even at 21, 22, I was like, you know, wait a minute. I'm not going to say yes or no. You know, I gave the politician answer. Answer the question you want to answer. And so I think I've been fairly transparent for 20 years and all of it's out there and available on Google. So I really don't, I don't think I have anything that people don't readily know about, aren't ready to ask about. All right. We'll shift it up then. I'll ask you a different difficult question. If you could get the truth about any question about the future of your life and you, you knew you'd get the truth, what would the question be? Basically, I'm like talking to a psychic. They're going to be able to tell me where I'll be in 20 years, that type of, I would like yeah. to know if I'll be rich. <laughs> I'm still after that, at least passively, still after that uh, Bruce Wayne money and uh, maybe not Bruce Wayne money, but Bruce Wayne lifestyle. And the, really the only thing that's changed is I see freedom in that. So it's not to live the, a lot of people ask like when, and it's actually interesting that people's interpretation of that, like, oh, you want to be rich? Oh, you want to be a playboy? Or you want to be Elon Musk? Or you, you want to lay on beaches in San Tropez? And I was like, no, I actually want the freedom 
that I envision that being the time that I would get back. And I believe that is invaluable. And currently that pathway has been shown to me through having the money available to live that lifestyle. So I would like someone if they were psychic to be like, yeah, yeah, you'll be good. 10, 20 years, you'll, you'll achieve that. I mean, I'd like it more. They said two years. <laughs> so that would be nice to know. That would be my question to them. So what if the answer is no? I have a response to that. And I actually just came up with it recently. Another book plug. I was recently reading Simon Sinek's Both Start With Why and Find Your Why. I'm reading them out of order because I got the titles wrong. So I'm reading Find Your Why, which is the second book. So y'all should start with why, which is the first book, which I got to reread. And, you know, you go through that journey, you find your why, basically. It's an explorative book for you to determine your why and purpose in life. And, I, you know, I'm going through this just kind of the point of where I am in my life. And I realized that I need to, it's somewhat of the pandemic, I need to connect again. I just felt disconnected from the purpose. Like, I'm making good money. I'm making more money than I've ever made in my life. I have more followers than I ever made in my life or I had in my life. But it just, it felt like for what? You know, for, like you said, influencer for what, uh, you know, I get likes. I'm like, OK, I can't pay my bills and likes. And it just kind of seemed arbitrary. And recently, which is, you know, big world, small world, I was actually at a meeting that I wasn't even supposed to be at. I got last second invited like, oh, you're here. Come on in. I'm sitting in the meeting and everyone there was just so connected to their job and their work. And everyone that came in the room was excited. They're like, yeah, and I love working here. And I've been here 15 years and 13 years. And what it was is everyone that worked there was connected to a purpose. I mean, it's one of those purpose driven mission or yeah. organizations. And I was like, I want that energy in my life. And so I jotted down a bunch of names. And I text my wife. I was like, I need to in this case, it'd be like get into the community and start working with these groups and having hands on hands and hands on and face to face interaction, which I think has been lost a lot in the pandemic. And I would may have lost my way as well. And so even if I didn't reach Bruce Wayne level <laughs> financial freedom, if I was and I can control that and never make a dollar and that would still bring satisfaction to my life. Yeah. Purpose definitely fills most money holes if you can find the purpose. So tell us how people can connect with you so they can find you, your website, YouTube, name a few things. Yeah, I'm universally branded under the Marcus Garrett. And as you said, my big focus is YouTube. So if you are into YouTube videos, check me out at the Marcus Garrett. If you prefer podcasts, I have the Marcus Garrett show where every week we have motivational conversations with your favorite influencers and entrepreneurs about life <laughs> after debt. And then if you are a, I just rebranded this, if you're an overworked and underpaid professional struggling with burnout and looking to monetize, you can visit the Marcus I <laughs> literally just wrote that tag like a week or two ago. So still getting the rest off of it. That's awesome. And I just want to say thank you. It's been great chatting with you. I'm glad you're here. We'll put all that stuff in the show notes and thank you for being present. Thanks for having me.